Okay, let's start. Um, welcome. So this talk is about uh, getting the, both, the best of both worlds. So we're going to talk about high performance privacy by design using Matryoshka and Spark. I'm Olivier Girardot. I'm a Scala, Python, and Java developer. I'm a data engineer, big data architect, co-founder of Ladder of Thoughts. Hello. Thanks for attending uh, this. Uh, hi. <laughs> Thanks for attending this uh, talk. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and thanks for Scalaio uh, and the all organizer to uh, uh, to for this uh, opportunity. Uh, I'm we am Zin Labidin, data engineer at uh, Abyss Next. I'm. Uh, enthusiastic about functional programming and uh, I'm a contributor to Scala Z Zio. And don't forget that I'm the number one fan of John DeGoss. <laughs> so uh, today we're going to talk first about a quick introduction into our problem statement. Uh, then we're going to talk about a privacy framework that we designed. This is not a theoretical uh, talk. This is something that we actually built, uh, set up, and put in productions with the feedbacks necessary to give you an insight into the performance results that we got. So let's talk a bit about privacy. I think you all know that in the European Union right now, uh, there's been huge work around GDPR and around the fact that user informations now are protected by the law and with huge penalties, which makes it very interesting uh, as a problem for us. So, for example, if we have some piece of data uh, that, let's say, is in JSON, like it happens sometimes, uh, we have some uh, not so confidential information like uh, the balance of your account, yeah? the age of a person, its name, uh, email addresses. These things might not be uh, suitable for divulging to anyone. So we might want to protect this kind of data, but it's especially difficult when we have, for example, nested data and we may not want to protect this data the same ways all the time. An email address, we might be interested in keeping the domain name uh, for coordinates like latitude and longitude. Uh, we might be able to just anonymize a quick part, a small part of this data and be able to use the rest. So we want to build something that we can trust. We want to build a generic framework that will be able to represent any object, handle any object field, no matter how nested, with an encryption function that is designed for this field, for this field type, while being sufficiently uh, general purpose and expressive enough that we want to use it. We want to want to use it. So we build a privacy framework. How can we build such a privacy framework? Well, first of all, our data, most of the time, at least every time, have a schema. We can annotate this schema with some kind of metadata, representing, for example, what this field means semantically, using the formalisms of semantic web, for example. And we might want, according to this kind of subject, we might want to apply a verb on it. For example, define a privacy strategy which will tell you generically what to do with a person's first name, what to do with a person's email. Do you want to hash it? Do you want to delete it? For example, a credit card, a number, you might want to delete it. You don't want to hash it, you don't want to mask it, you just don't want it to be appearing on anyone's screen. So this privacy framework is actually can be represented using a simple type. We have a map of a sequence of string that will be the semantic tags we put on data and a privacy strategy. The tags can be pretty simple. It can be just, this is an address, this is a first name, this is a last name, this is an email, this is an ID, this is a password. And the privacy strategy, we have 
two uh, main contracts that we wanted to respect. We want an encrypt strategy that will take these values and cipher it, mask it, replace it with stars or just put longs. And we want to know exactly how this privacy strategy might change the schema. For example, if I have a, a schema with an ID that is a long, well, this ID might end up being a string because I don't want to give like uh, ages of people, but I want to give ranges of ages, like from <coughs> 0 to 12 years old, from 12 years old to 40 years old. Something like ranges that might not be ending up being a long. So any privacy strategy might change the schema. Now we're going to talk about recursive data structures because our problem statement needs to be handling any kind of data, no matter how nested. Yeah, in order to apply privacy with different strategies, we need to deal with recursive data structure. So let's understand, first of all, uh, what is recursive data structure. Um, we have, uh, uh, for example, uh, in our daily programming life, we face a recursive data structure like list, uh, binary trees, and uh, we call a recursive data structure when we have a, a type which refers to itself. So let's see an example. Uh, for example, a number can be either zero or successor of other number. So successor of other number is, uh, refers to itself, so it is a recursive data structure. And in general, with, uh, when we work with recursive data structure, we need to evaluate it into a simple value. So for example, here we want uh, to evaluate successor of successor of successor of zero. So we need to implement a recursive function. And for uh, every, uh, while we have a smaller version of this uh, uh, data type, we add one plus we evaluate the, this smaller version until the smallest version zero. And then a uh, number to int will uh, return right away uh, the computed value. So now we understand what is uh, actually recursive data structure and how we work with it. Uh, and now let's reveal our data structure. So now that we understand what, it, what is a recursive data structure, then let's present our data structure. We want to be able to represent any kind of data. It is, let's say, traditional in big data now to separate the schema of the data from its values. Why? But first of all, for schema evolution. Your data will be written once, but the schema might change over time. You might add fields, you might delete fields, you might create aliases. You want the data to be durable. You want the schema to be able to evolve. According to certain rules, you need to follow certain rules to have like uh, back compatible uh, schemas. But you can evolve the schema. So for example, here we have a simple table with multiple rows of data. Each piece of data has its type, but each piece of data also has a corresponding field name in the schema and the corresponding type defined in the schema. So any computation, for example, a Spark computation framework, will expect the first field to be an ID in position zero and expect it to be a long. So the schema is, for example, a struct. A struct is a sequence of fields and names. If you take, for example, the Spark schema, well, it's pretty straightforward and simple. You have a sealed trait that will be the data type. Each type represents a data type. You've got an array type. You've got a struct type. The array type is multiple elements. The struct types is, well, basically an object. And you have simple types. Of course, in Spark and in many other frameworks, you might have like more complex types. You've got a map type or things like that. But we'll stick to that for now, because we don't need that much map types in our computations. 
So if we mimic that and actually make it a bit more uh, type safe, well, we can define our schema that is basically the same ADT. That's to say that you have the T schema, which is composed of a T struct, a trait that will be the T value, and a T array. So you've got like nested fields, uh, for example, structs and arrays, and you've got simple or leaves that will be the values. Of course, the values is not a recursive uh, starting point. The value is the end game. You don't go much deeper uh, after a value. So how to represent it using Scala? Well, you can design an ADT, an algebraic data type, where uh, your struct will be composed of fields, which will be the list of the field name and the T schema. And your array will be just a simple element type. And of course, you've got all the values that you need to discriminate. Then, this is actually representing our recursion. This is actually representing the nested behavior of features of our data. A Spark data is pretty much straightforward. It's an array of any. You don't know exactly what you're handling. You've got a row, which is just basically not exactly a wrapper of an array of any. It's extending an array of any, which is in the letter. Um, we don't want that. We want to be able to clearly type our data because, uh, well, typing is easy and typing gives you additional information. So our data is pretty much the same mimic uh, tree as our schema with small changes. For example, uh, I, don't need, I don't need to extend the T schema now. I've got a sealed trait that is a G data. And uh, this time my array uh, type it's not a, anymore an element type. It's elements. It's the proper elements. On one case, I have the element type, which is just a simple call. And on the other hand, I have elements, which is the sequence of G data, the sequence of elements which compose my array of elements. And the value fields uh, now are, well, the proper values. I don't have anything more uh, than the values that is wrapped around. Uh, sealed uh, around the case class. Uh, just as a reminder, in this uh, ADT, in our schema, I also added metadata. Why? Because this metadata can give us additional information on each columns. For example, do I have tags? Do I have the semantic tags on this data? Is the field nullable or not? Am I to expect the values to be null at some point? These metadata can be pretty useful and are actually the foundation of our framework. So now let's talk about Matryoshka. A quick show of hand, uh, who knows Matryoshka? Actually, we all know Matryoshka. It is the Russian dolls. <laughs> but today we will talk about the Scala library Matryoshka we, that uh, specializes uh, on uh, implementing recursion schemes. Um, Matryoshka uh, is, a, we are going to explore a, a recursive approach, a generalized recursive approach um, using uh, Matryoshka. In order to do that, we have to follow magical steps. And uh, after that, we will enjoy the recursion uh, functions in Matryoshka. Okay. Uh, and uh, we will uh, uh, explain Kata, Anna, Ailo, but actually Matryoshka has more uh, than inter uh, more uh, interesting functions. Uh, and we, uh, in order to solve pro the, uh, problems, our problem, we uh, use it uh, Kata, Anna, and Hilo. So let's start with this uh, first step. Uh, we have a uh, uh, recursive uh, data structure. The first step is to add the type parameter and to remove our recursion. And instead of uh, the recursive reference, we uh, update it to, we uh, change it to type A, but now our data structure uh, is flat, not, not recursive. Mm. 
what if we want, we still want to have a recursive data structure and how can we define a schema F with different level? Schema F, for example, here, uh, schema F has two level, but what if we have uh, schema F of schema F of schema F of schema F? So we need something like this. We need a type constructor with uh, this schema F and uh, and whatever uh, our uh, number of uh, deep depth <laughs> uh, we have, uh, we can use this type. But Matryoshka already has this type. It's called uh, it's called um, a fix. Fix is uh, uh, it's uh, we can define fix in order. It's like we have this type, which has a functor, and our functor would be our schema f. And now we can uh, we can define our schema using functor and we we wrap every instance of uh, schema f uh, inside a fix and uh, now whatever uh, in every level we can uh, we can define of schema f okay in every level, uh, when we ha whatever uh, when we have a recursive uh, schema, uh, for example, uh, schema uh, uh, struct f of uh, struct f of boolean f with different shapes, we can use fixed type, and uh, we uh, wrap wrap every uh, s schema f. Uh, subtype with uh, inside fix and uh, we need to tell uh, we need to add an implicit instance of Scala Z uh, functor uh, to to, ma to make Matryoshka able to uh, traverse our data structure so we define uh, the functor with uh, the, its uh, unique map uh, with unique uh, function and now we are ready what we we want to do actually with that we want to build from a, sp a spark schema we want to build schema f and then we want to collapse it uh, to uh, uh, spark schema f it's like we want to uh, convert it from data type to uh, schema f and then from schema f to data type we need recursive functions but uh, we have matryoshka now we can use it let's start with the first point in order to build schema f from spark schema we need to have a function which comes from a to f of a in matryoshka we have a pattern functor called coalgebra it takes a functor and a type a and now our functor is schema f we have already uh, define it an implicit instance of uh, schema f so we can use coalgebra and coalgebra is like a function which comes from a to f of a so and uh, we need to define this function which comes from data type to schema f of data type to build this schema f and coalgebra uh, will come uh, will uh, apply this uh, okay uh, 
Uh, Coalgebra is like a, res a recipe. We need to define in each step what we want to do. What is our computation in each step? And it will uh, browse the structure from top to down. It's, it will start from struct type, for example, and then long type and the diff, diff uh, value. But this is uh, just for uh, every layer. We need, to, we need an engine to do that, to, to do every, uh, all uh, this, uh, to do the recursion, because we didn't see in the previous code any recursion here. But Matryoshka can do that for us for free. So we have a data type here. We need to build from it a schema f. We need a function which takes a coalgebra. And we have already implemented our coalgebra. So we call it, and we will get our schema f wrap it in fix. So as we saw, now, uh, f fix uh, has we, uh, with different uh, our schema f is recursive now. So let's let's see the second uh, point that we want to do. We want to collapse a schema f to Spark schema. So we need a function which comes from f of a to a. We want to collapse our schema f to data type. Matryoshka has a, a, a functor pattern called algebra, which is like a function which comes from f of a to a. And our f is schema f to data type. And it's also our recipe every, in every step, in every layer of our schema F, we define what is our computation. And algebra will browse our data structure, which, which is now schema F, from bottom to up. So it will compute the long before and string, and then the, array, uh, the struct f. So we need what is the function which will do the recursion for us. We need the function which takes an algebra, which call it kata in Matryoshka. So, and we can, uh, we have a fixed schema f, and we call apply with this uh, uh, algebra, and we will get right away our uh, data type. So, okay, our goal is to apply privacy in our schema F. For example, like we saw before, uh, we have, uh, uh, we want to encrypt our schema. For example, we have, um, uh, an element of type int, we want to change it of type string, for example. So we, we need to have the initial data type of uh, its uh, Spark schema, and we want to transform it. So it's like something like this. We build our schema F, and we will have a uh, from a value, initial value, and then we will uh, collapse it in, into another value. So it's clear now, we will need to have an uh, anamorphism than kata. We will need to have coalgebra and algebra. And uh, Matryoshka has hylomorphism, which can do that for us instead of 
doing uh, of calling two functions, we will call hylomorphism, uh, but we need both coalgebra and algebra. So this is the signature of uh, hylomorphism. And to recap, uh, Anna is for building and it requires coalgebra. Kata, it's for fold, and uh, when you want to collapse your factor to a simple value, you can um, define an algebra and use kata. And high low is for transformation, refold, unfold, and then fold, and it requires both algebra and coalgebra. So now we can see what we did with this in our engi engines. So now that we have the building blocks that uh, Matryoshka offers us, let's apply them to something real. Um, the first engine that I'm going to talk about is the uh, Matryoshka uh, engine. The Matryoshka privacy engine. So the problem is that we need to encrypt data but only the semantic tags that are within the schema of our data match those of a privacy strategy. So, in a way, we need to be able to look at both the data and the schema at the same time to decide what to do with a piece of data. So let's zip it. The most naive approach uh, to that problem would be to zip recursively the data and the schema together and to pattern match those to use using an algebra, then if I have a proper tags, then I do something to the data. I mutate the data accordingly, according to the privacy strategy that is defined by those tags. Okay? So zipping the data recursively <laughs> sounds like a pain. What can we do uh, to do that? Well, actually, Matryoshka has a pattern that is NFT. It allows you to annotate any kind of functor W with a label of type E. And it still has that all that we need, that A that we need, because the hole in the functor, in the schema F, or in, this, in the F T, is actually something that will be filled during computation on every layer. That's to say that when you're computing something with Matryoshka, this A is actually the carrier it's actually going to be used with the intermediate results that your computation defines. So we're going to use this NFT, but still we need a way to uh, do this zipping. For example, if I have a schema with uh, a person name and the gender, which is a string with tags one and the longs with tags two, because the semantic tags has, are basically, uh, and the type, are basically what interests me most. And if I have the corresponding data with the string F, which is called John McLean, because eh, why not? Uh, I need to be able to zip those and get, in the end, my half T with, on the left-hand side, the string with the schema, and on the right-hand side, the data. This is going to be my goal. How to do that? Well, with Matryoshka, we will be using the NFT, but luckily the NFT is a case class. So I have two ways of handling that. I can pattern match it and extract the necessary components, uh, or I can use two uh, helper functions that are defined on the NFT. One to get the label, the E, and one to get the lower functor. So how to zip? Well, using Matryoshka, all you need is to, match, to, to zip, match the data and the schema. It's not that bad. I mean, if you think about it, when you have a schema in the, when you have a struct in the schema, you expect a struct in the data. When you have an array in the schema, you expect an array in the data. If you have a value, you expect a value. Anything else, anything else is an incompatibility between your schema and your data. This is, so this is pretty easy to actually uh, define in terms of pattern matching. I have struct on the left hand side, struct on the right hand side. One in the schema, one is the data. 
Anything else is an incompatibility. So I can't exactly use a co-algebra just plain and simple like we define. I need something that I need something that is def that is able to represent this incompatibility. So we are going to use a co-algebra M, which output is not the data with schema, which is the R of T. It's going to be a, a disjunction between the incompatibility and my output. Okay. Uh, as some of uh, you might have uh, noticed, there is some kind of kind projector here. So let's build our privacy engine now. We have prepared the data, we have prepared the types, and as usual in FP, once you have prepared the type, you've done more than half the way. So all I need to do is to use my privacy strategies and actually unwrap my half T, check the tags on the schema, and if for those tags I have a privacy strategy, apply it. If I don't, then just get back the original value. Not that hard, huh? The dot right is here to represent that I'm only going to use this algebra if I have no incompatibility. It doesn't matter to try to cipher something that is not compatible with the schema that we expect it to be. Putting it all together, well, the starting point of my computation is both the schema and the data apart. I'm going to call the, the ILO M. It's going to apply the zip with schema co-algebra and then the privacy algebra co uh, as a, a byproduct. In the end, all I have to do is match the output, whether I have incompatibilities or I'm going to have my result properly computed, properly privacy, properly protected. So we have like our most versatile, generic, uh, but not quite so efficient privacy engine. Why isn't it efficient? Well, first of all, we are going to see that in our next engine, which is called Lambda. We don't have that much imagination for the name, sorry. The Matryoshka engine is perfect, but for every piece of data, we need to zip it with its schema. It looked like the most simplistic, most naive approach, and it is. Because for a thousand rows of the same table, we will duplicate the same schema for each element. Is it just possible to prepare this kind of mutation? I mean, I can just look at the schema and define what to do. Yeah, we can try that. We're going to build some kind of lambda that will go down into the data according to a schema if, and only if, there's something to do. That means that if I have 350 fields, but only one that needs to be privacied, I don't need to go down every field. I just need to be able to look and say, OK, this is the field I need to protect. So we're going to define a, a sealed trait that is going to com be composed of two uh, type of mutation. The no mutation op, which is basically a case object that defines eh, nothing to do here. And the go down that is going to wrap a lambda. And all I need to do is, according to a schema, according to a schema f, create this mutation. What would be the form of our lambda? Well, it's pretty straightforward. I'm going to have like some kind of apply function to apply my uh, lambda to a piece of data. And I need some way to compose those. So I'm going to define the end then. The end then is going to use uh, our computation and chain transformations. So I have nothing to do, or I need to go down into my data and apply a lambda. So let's build the algebra. This time I don't need an ILO, I just need a kata and a privacy algebra. First things first, let's match values. Well, values are pretty simple. I check the privacy strategies, but this time I pretend like I have the data. I define a lambda that will take this piece of data and actually apply the privacy. And I wrap it into a go down OP. If I have nothing to do, then a no mutation OP is going to be outputted. Now let's compose. As I'm running out of time, I'm only going to go through the array part. But the array part is pretty easy. If I have something to do on the element type, remember that the element type used to be the element type, but now it's the carrier of my computation. It's the previously computed 
piece of information. So now the previous OP is whether I have something to do on the elements, or if I don't have something to do on the elements, then no mutation. If I have something to do, then I need to transform each and every element and apply the previous computation. For struct, it would be exactly the same thing, but I need to look at the fields. If at least one field needs to be mutated, then I'm going to need to unwrap and rewrap every struct. So according to any given schema, we can now build an only once lambda, which is perfect for streaming application. I'm going to compute it at startup and then apply it during my streaming application. So we now have a very efficient engine, right? At least on the heap and managed by the garbage collector. Let's go deeper. Applying any of the previous engine to an Apache Spark job is GC intensive. Why? Because we need to transform from, for example, a Spark row to a data functor, and then back to my NFT for the Matryoshka engine, and then back to the data functor, and then back to a Spark SQL row. This is pretty inefficient. It's not really integrated with Spark. I have to go back to RDDs. I have to break the logical plan optimization. It's tedious to use. Well, it has every advantages. So the Catalyst engine, some of you may know it, is a pretty well-designed engine that allows you to do code generation. And this is the foundation of the Spark SQL data frames. We're going to try to leverage this Catalyst engine and create a new expression. This expression is actually going to create code. What I need to do is to define a new algebra that will take my schema and actually create Java code to mutate of heap, or rather saying the unsafe API, mutate using the tungsten data format, uh, any piece of data that needs to be protected. I'm going to go there. This is not a hack. This is something that Spark allows you to do. It's just not very well documented. So what is going to happen is from a schema F, I'm going to create Java code as a string. And Spark is going to compile it using a compiler called Janino, send this bytecode to every executor, and do the computation on every executor. First things first, my output, my contract, is going to be something that takes an input variable and gives out a string, and gives you, as a piece of information, the output variable where I'm going to put my data protected, or no, nothing to do. Creating a new expression is a bit tedious, but it's quite straightforward. You define if your expression is nullable, you define the uh, expected data type that is going to uh, be outputted, and you define some fallbacks, and then the do gen codes. I'm going to go a bit quicker, but uh, the whole code is available on GitHub, compiles, and has even some tests to show you that it works. <laughs> so let's create the Catalyst code. Once again, I'm going to just uh, pattern match on all of my pattern match on all of my structures, like struct f, array f, and the values. If my values do does not do, they do not have any tags, then I don't need to do no up. If they do have any tags, I need to check. So once again, with the values, this time, it's, uh, well, using string interpolation, it's not that bad to read, but it's not perfect. I'm going to output a string that is the Java type, the output Java type, the name of the output variable, and my computation with a cast, because eh, I need to go back to objects to simplify things. <laughs> so there's a cast here that is going to take my input variable name, apply any uh, computation on it. Why do I have the input variable as a parameter? Well, because if I'm in a struct or in an array or if anything, well, I don't know who's going to call me. As a, as a transformation, as a recursion parameter, I don't know who's going to call me. So the caller must provide the input variable, but I'm going to provide the output variable. So I'm going to create Catalyst code with a new uh, output variable. Uh, just for information, the context.add reference object is a way to um, leak information from your driver to your executors. That's going to serialize the cipher lambda and then put it on every executor, which is basically what Spark does anyway. 
VRF is uh, way more interesting because it's not like I'm going to use Guava or anything. Uh, remind, just as a reminder, I'm in Java. I'm in plain vanilla Java. Most of the time, I end up also using something like system.arraycopy to be able to be more efficient. So this is a plain old uh, for loop where I'm going to define the position and apply, once again, the element types. The element types is my carrier. It's the previously computed value, but this time it's some code. So when I'm calling apply here, I'm actually giving as input variable a way to access the position of my input in the array. And the output of the apply is going to be a code block. So I'm building a string with some code blocks. I'm composing strings. Just, um, just to give you a sense of pain, the main debug tool that you have at your disposal here is to forget a semicolon. That way you will get a precise output of what was uh, written <coughs> in terms of string. And this way you can debug. Which is nice. Uh, the struct type is basically the same thing, but I'm using internal rows. Of course, the code is simplified because you have to handle unsafe API. That's to say that uh, if you can do some computations without bringing anything onto the heap, onto the managed part of the heap by the garbage collector, then you will definitely want to do so because this is going to be way more efficient. But once again, same thing, I'm composing, I'm using the fields code, applying to the temp row and just go down. Putting it all together, whether I have a no op, and in this time uh, the output is going to be the input, otherwise I'm going to call my catalyst code, my method, with the input variable being the top level out input, and then get the output, privacy. Now it's for real. It was tough, but now the data stays off heap uh, if it needs to. Of course, off heap, for those who know, is a bit of a long stretch. It's not exactly off heap, it's just unsafe. It's not managed by the garbage collector. It can even stay in the tungsten format for longs, ints, I mean, something that has a fixed size. And it is deeply integrated with Spark in an unhacky way. You're not breaking the logical plan optimization. You're not going back to RDDs. You're just using the data frames the way they are intended to be used. Now let's do a performance trial. Uh, on an Apache Mesos cluster with uh, 10 cores, 5 gigs of heap by executors, 5 gigs of compressed uh, Apache Parquet files, the Matrishko engine was not that bad after optimization, 70 minutes, 45 minutes for the Lambda engine, and 21 minutes for the CoGen one. Honestly, I don't think you can go down well below that uh, because, well, I mean, yeah, maybe using Rust, I don't know. <laughs> In conclusion. Yeah, as, as we see, uh, using function programming, uh, we managed uh, to, uh, we created three engines and uh, we need to figure out how to have uh, a good data structure to be able to uh, to have uh, to be able to have a clear code for our colleagues to be reused and maintainable. Uh, so uh, and uh, for me, actually, it took uh, it took a few weeks to learn Matryoshka and how to use Matryoshka. Uh, I recommend to, uh, if you are interested to learn about Matryoshka, uh, start with very simple example, and then you will, uh, you can uh, work with Matryoshka. And it's very important to have a good design uh, to uh, your data structure. And that, uh, ha uh, that was, uh, um, that has a, a good impact to our performance. Uh, yeah. Voila. Special thanks to the people that made it possible. I did not put it into these slides, but the creators of Matryoshka, 
might be thanked. <laughs> Amin Saha Gama, who worked with us on it, Hazid Ben Ahmed, who worked on us with this, and Valentin Kazas for the foundation of this work. Sorry for the slide, we were a bit sick at the time. <laughs> To go further, all the code and slides are available here on the GitHub uh, page. I'm going to tweet the link and uh, the slides as well. As I said, this is a fully functional, uh, simplified, of course, because the code that we designed is proprietary. So this is a copy uh, where we simplified things, where you have the bulk of the engine and all the tests to show that it works and that it's efficient. You should check out the ongoing effort around Scalazi schema. And you can contact us on Twitter at Ogerado or at William Zin if you have any questions. Thank you. Of course, we would gladly take your questions now, except if you're hungry. Questions? How do you take it down a count uh, new policies, new privacy policies? Well, actually, uh, the privacy strategies can be encoded in two ways. We decided to encode them, uh, giving them. We we had. Um, we are more talking about organizations here. Okay, uh, so a special team is designed uh, to annotate the schemas with the semantic tags necessary to represent the data. So we have a data management team that is responsible for that, and that must encode the data properly uh, with the schema. And uh, we have uh, another team responsible in terms of law uh, of the privacy that encodes in JSON files the semantic tags that are the targets and the privacy strategies that they want to apply with certain parameters. So that's basically the way to uh, parameterize this. But new strategies have to be like coded and tested before being usable uh, into the framework. But the application of those strategies is configurable. Yeah, the strategies can be like uh, really, really slow, <laughs> maybe. But uh, yeah. It's not something that uh, usually we uh, do because the privacy strategies are implemented by the coding team, by the dev team, so they are able to do uh, performance checks, performance benchmark. If we manage to know, if we notice that any kind of strategy activation is actually getting the whole system slower, then we can bench it and fix it. But this, not, this is not like you know some eval code, some some pseudo code that some people will put, like a, a Python eval. Uh, this is something that is just configurable. They are not going to be writing, re writing code in JSON files. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the presentation. I had a question regarding the benchmarks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. So it's five gigabytes in place. 10 cores. Um, it's not, uh, it's an Apache Mesos cluster, so you don't know for sure the number of JVM that you're launching, but uh, you're launching like uh, two JVMs or one, it depends on the time. I think it was two at the time, and five gigs of IP by executors. Okay, and um, regarding the um, uh, percentage of data that is actually encrypted? Yeah, there was like uh, 10 fields uh, out of 50. Something like that. So like one fifth. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Uh, thank you for your excellent talk. Um, mm -hmm. I have a few questions. So now it looks like there are three different engines, but did I understand correctly if the Matryoshka is kind of the base engine and the other two just expand on it as a kind of implementation detail, we're still having these recursion schemes at the base? The three engines are using recursion schemes, but the first one is not the foundation for the other ones. The first one is, is zipping data and schema together, so it needs to have both the schema and the data on the heap uh, available at the same time. The second one is just looking at the data and generating on the heap a transformation. And the last one is going to try to generate Java code that is going to work unsafe as much as possible. So no, they have um, different use cases. 
uh, and you can see it's a simplistic uh, approach this talk because uh, in real life we have some indirection levels we have something like i don't know if you're familiar with json patches but uh, using uh, a formalism called json patches you can have like some kind of event sourcing data that is going to say that I have a path and a value. And this is a very complex use case that we had to uh, implement using the Matryoshka engine because you need to look at the path that this uh, patch is referring to to define the schema and to define if you need to priv privacy the, the value. So there is some kind of uh, recursion within the recursion schemes <laughs> that we need to, that we needed to, to implement in the Matryoshka engine. Uh, one more engine. Uh, one, one more question. Um, mm -hmm. Do you ever get feedback like, okay, this is all very cool and generic, but uh, wouldn't it be just easier to have a kind of junior for every new data type, just type it out, and and then uh, because this is like too hard to learn, this, this is like you need to be this wizard to understand uh, these um, recursion schemes. I I have studied them myself, and I find that not everybody is. Uh, that doesn't learn as uh, as quickly as others. I agree. I agree with a lot of what you said. But one thing to understand is that, um, well, the most uh, important and interesting uh, engine is the cogen engine, the last one, and Matryoshka is just the simplest part in that. <laughs> I mean, Matryoshka is is just the tip of the iceberg. Learning and and dealing with the internals of Spark is actually the hard part. I did the same kind of, um, of work, using creating a new expressions uh, a while back, but using plain old recursions, and it's just unmaintainable. Using Matryoshka, it's at least understandable. This is something that actually simplifies uh, this kind of work, and this is something that would not be possible to maintain without uh, a recursion scheme framework where you only have like four cases to handle, and that's it. But I agree with you that there's a, a long learning curve, and without, for example, the man just riding right next to you, it would not have been possible. The so man needed like eight months to understand that <laughs> and it would uh, it wouldn't have been possible with this man over there. Okay, so let's just let's jump back ping pong. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> Any more questions? So, as far as I understood, uh, the thing is uh, implementation, which is uh, direct at Spark. Mm -hmm. So, uh, imagine if I want to apply the same thing, but for another streaming platform. Thing, uh, uh, you need a symbolic engine like Spark has, yeah. which is something that Beam does not have, which is something that Flink does not exactly have, I think. Yeah. So, my next question is, is are we at the limit of uh, optimization in the Matryoshka side, or uh, is there anything we can do to improve the performance? Uh, uh, the performance is not going to come from Matryoshka. Matryoshka is going, if we're talking about Spark computation, the work is done at startup uh, on the driver side. So basically, it's a no-brainer. It's going to take like a few milliseconds or a few seconds to, to create the Java code and compile it and send it to the executors. The real bulk of the performance will come from Spark itself or how you tune Spark. So that means staying unsafe as much as possible uh, to not leverage the GC uh, at all. Um, in terms of performance, well, uh, Databricks and Spark did a few benchmarks trying to check if uh, it would be better off for them to stay completely off heap or just stay in the heap but unsafe. And if I remember correctly, the results were that it didn't change that much and it made operations so much more complicated. Because when you're uh, handling a, a big data cluster, you have to allocate containers. And if you do not take into account, uh, you, you just specify the heap most of the time. And if you do not take uh, into account some kind of off heap computation, then you're going to be killed by Mesos or Yarn or any kind of <coughs> container platform. So um, in terms of performance, what can we do? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can yell at your users for uh, not having flat data. That's one way to look at it. Um, but in terms of performance, I don't think there's much. Uh, I don't. At least I don't have any ideas. <laughs> 
But if you, if you do, just contribute. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.